Ah, gini gini jawan, yang jadi bijar kelak web, yang na gumbenger niger, na begala banjelang wow. Na jagaan orang yang wajar, kulin wajar, na jagaan orang orang yang girwa yang berjana, warangji girwa. Berapa dengan di Yerali, Yila ada jalan bau. Engram berapa dengan Yila yang wajar, wajar nyirna, yang wajar nyangen, menyala girwa do. Dalam dang wajar ida gay, ila. Yang girwa jogger, janggalai, nyangen bamun. Ida irali jo jurang, narangi ay, jurang ay. Niala gedila dalam dau yang wajar. Menyala, bagai nani nambai. Engram jogger, yung gumbang, umago guri wajar. Muru gumbang, wajar, umago guri gundi. Mau gemang umaga gori juno ibin, wali gurang umaga gori girwa wow, dan orang umaga ni aman di gay gori girwa. Gala yela, yang merangji girwa jaganjing, nujaman jaganjing agai, yurunai nak arparwa agai, mara warunga, naja nina garan orang wow. So hello wow. My name is Clark Webb. I'm a Goombanger person. I'm also Bunjlung from the north coast of uh, New South Wales. Uh, so we're pretty much halfway between Sydney and Brisbane on the east coast. Um, I just wanted to pay my respects to country here, Kulin country, and to also Wurundjeri people, uh, mob. Um, as we know, long ago when, when Europeans first arrived in this place, they came across the lands that were perfect. Um, and the reason that those lands were perfect is because they were managed that way for eternity. And so the people who were managing those lands were also healthy and happy and, and strong. But for some reason, which I still can't get my head around, the Western idea was that this land needed to be improved. And I don't understand that because how do you improve something that's already perfect? And by improving it, they did bad to country. So when they did bad to country, they also did bad to the people. And they made country sick. We know the atrocities that then occurred, the stealing of lands, the stealing of children, um, the spread of disease, the massacres, all of these atrocities and genocides that have, have happened in our history. We know that, um, and in dis despite all of all of those atrocities and all of the trauma that accompanies it in our community, the mob here, Wurundjeri people, Koori people, uh, still stand strong and stand tall and stand with chests out and fists in the air. And um, I'm not sure if the mob here uh, uh, understand that a lot of us mobs from different parts of the country see every, all the work here and we appreciate the work that's being done. Um, they're standing up against continued colonisation and staring conti the continuum of colonisation in the face and calling it out. Um, it's something that we appreciate um, from all over the place. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, the local people here as well, and thank you, Ani Dai, as well, for the welcome, and I want to acknowledge... Um, so, um, so it amazes me in, in such a place that has really borne the brunt of a lot of colonisation, a lot of invasion and colonisation. We still have these stories and the sites um, and language. It's something that's very special, I feel. So I want to acknowledge, acknowledge that before I start. And it's important that we acknowledge these things because um, our, the development of our school, the Goomba Gingana Freedom School, um, and the sustainability of our school does not occur if we're not calling out colonisation and if we're not staring it in the face and standing up against it. So I really wanted to um, show my appreciation to the mob here. And uh, thank you for having me as well. So uh, I'm the um, CEO of Bulletin Moulin Yungan Aboriginal Corporation, um, which is the proprietor, our corporation is the proprietor of the Goombenga Gingana Freedom School, uh, which is the first uh, bilingual uh, Aboriginal bilingual school, oh sorry, first bilingual school of an Aboriginal language in New South Wales. Um, and basically I'm just going to tell 
the story of how we got to where we are today. So how do I click along? Is there a clicker? <coughs> Sorry, I'm not real tech savvy. Sorry, oh. Ah, beautiful. Cool. Mm -hmm. One more. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm not real tech. Um, so there's, it's important to acknowledge that there was a lot in, in our community, there was a lot that happened before I was even thought of, before any of us had thought of. So we were very lucky in, in, our, in our country to have a lot of elders who I feel like could see into the future and they could see that the work that they were doing would sometime, at some stage, be picked up and it'd be really important for our community. So uh, in Gumbangar territory, Europeans really started to arrive uh, in the 1860s with the introduction of the Robertson's Land Act. So that's when the population of Europeans really started to increase. And obviously things were rapidly changing for our community. And so a number of elders then started to record their language with uh, early explorers and early historians. So there's a lot of written resources from like 1900, 1901, and that type of thing. So those resources are really important. In 1930, an, old, an elder by the name of Uncle Philip Shannon um, became quite close with a German-American linguist by the name of Gerhard Lavez. Um, Uncle Philip was born in 1860, and so by 1930 he was 70 years of age. And so the language that he gave to Gerhard Lavez is a very old, our oldest form of our language, Gumbanger. And he recorded more than 20 stories completely in Gumbanger language. So that resource is really, really vital to us. And then later on, from the 1940s to the 1970s, there was a number of elders who then voice recorded their language as technology improved. Uh, so one of the people who recorded Gumbanger was my great-great-grandfather um, by the name of Clarence Skinner. Uh, so he recorded a number of stories and a number of translations. Uh, and perhaps, well, the biggest amount of, the largest amount of Gumbanger material was provided by an old man, Uncle Tiger Buchanan. Um, and Uncle Tiger recorded hours upon hours of Gumbanger. And there's some just free speech and telling stories, Gumbanger stories, but then there's also literally tapes where he's teaching us <laughs> Gumbanger language. So he's slowing it right down. So that's why I say he's like had the foresight to understand that we'd need those tapes at some, at some time in the future. Um, in the 1980s, some Gumbanger elders became very, very distressed at the decline of their language, Gumbanger. So there was a group of 10 elders who decided to do something about it. And so they started to catch up every week and they used to pool their pension money in order to um, get food and to start to um, find historical records uh, of the, some of the words that they'd forgotten. And they had heard about this young man, well, he was a young man at that time, Brother Steve Morelli. Um, they had heard it, that, that he was a linguist. So they asked him to come and use his expertise to support them in bringing their language back. Uh, so as a trained linguist, that's what he did. And Brother Steve is still with us today. He's not a young man anymore, um, but he is doing really vital work in our community still, in our language space. So. That vision from our elders in the 1980s, they then opened the Murabai Language and Culture Cooperative in 1986. And Murabai have gone on to produce three versions of the Gumbanger Dictionary um, and the Gumbanger Stories book, all which are really important resources for us. And they also actively teach, teach our language. Um, uh, and they also support another 10 Aboriginal languages along the northern rivers of New South Wales. So they do a lot of really important work. And um, I was lucky enough, a number of my friends and, and family were lucky enough to spend a lot of time with our last elder to speak Gumbanger as his first language, Uncle, Uncle Bing Laurie. And uh, our 
language learning really accelerated with him speaking the language to us because he'd speak it fast. So we just had to switch on and it was really important. So that's all of this work sort of historically is important to where we are now because our school uh, doesn't happen with, without all of that foresight of our elders. And even though all that work went on, we didn't wake up in 2020 and go, let's build a school. <laughs> it's been a long process um, since we started thinking about the need for our school. So Bemanac, or, or so Bullion and Mulan Young and Aboriginal Corporation, or Bemanac, we started our programs in 2010, um, originally through after-school Guri Learning Centres. Um, it was a completely voluntary uh, service for approximately three years until we started getting funding in. And once we started getting funding, we started to increase the scope of our programs. So we implemented the Nyungan Tutoring Program, which is an in-school uh, tutoring service, uh, which we provide to four local schools with Guri kids. Uh, we also started our first Goombanger community class in 2014, um, and that class is continuing. Um, and, we've, and we've then uh, increased the number of classes. So we do now th four community classes per week um, in Coss Harbour and Grafton. Uh, language in schools is really a big focus for us. So we, we teach language in approximately or more than 20 education centres, both Aboriginal and mainstream, um, high schools, primary schools and preschools. And our uh, main priority is Kulai Aboriginal Preschool, which is really important for a number of reasons. Um, it's 100% Aboriginal student enrolment. And then for the Goombangara School, primary school, we target kids from Kulai because they've been learning Goombangara since the age of three. And so then they transition then into a bilingual primary school as well. So get, getting language to our kids early um, and then they sustain it through primary school. So that's really important to us in 20, last year. So we've been working with Kulai since 2016, um, teaching language, it was originally once per week. In 2018, we increased that to everyday teaching and also the staff of Kulai Preschool actively learn Goombangara at our uh, community classes. So they are then doing language all day with their children as well. So at this time last year, we were comfortable to say that Kulai is a truly bilingual preschool as well. Um, so there's some great work happening there. We've, we also run cultural camps, which we have since 2014, which are really important to because our, our language belongs in the country. So it's really important that we are also connecting to cultural practices through our camps, connecting to country, connecting to our stories, all of those type of things. In 2017, we opened a couple of social enterprises. Um, so one being the Gumbenga, uh, Ging and Gumbenga cultural experience, as well as Nyungan Gopi Cafe. Um, Gopi's a little bit lazy for coffee. <laughs> um, we could have probably said Nalo Guru, uh, so which would be black water, right? So could have had that for coffee. Um, but anyway, so we're going with Nyungan Gopi, which means perfect coffee or strong coffee. Um, and that cafe and our tours occur on a on a mountain which we, we call Nigi Nigi. Um, in English, they call it Sealy Lookout. So it gets approximately 250,000 visitors, visitors per year. And at the time of opening that cafe, it was about providing um, employment and training for our mob and then eventually turning a profit so the profits can be reinvested into our programs and eventually in our school. Um, at that time, the unemployment rate of our community in Coss Harbour was 24.5%. So almost a quarter of our population unemployed. And that's why we felt the need that we had to, we had to change that. And because, well, we'll get to that. But the issue is that a lot of our young people move away for employment opportunities. So we wanted to change all of these things. 
Um, and we also have an eco resort, which is in DA development application at the moment, and hopefully that'll be approved soon. Um, and all this is important to the self sustainability of our school, and I'll get to why self sustainability is so important to us um, and to maintaining our school, which we just opened six months ago. So I'm going to keep taking on this little store, uh, tour of our school. Oops. Oh, oh. <laughs> Taking a tour first. In the baby country, our stories and culture are written in our landscape. In Yin Oromo, Arawara, Monyu Monyu, Nyingi Nyingi. So I just wanted to share that little bit of a video. That voice over at the start, that's, a, that's actually Uncle Bing. And so you can hear when he speaks our language, he speaks it with the old accent. And so um, unfortunately we lost Uncle Bing in, in 2019. So he never saw the school come to fruition, which is um, disappointing. But um, his legacy lives on and um, Many or a few, and many or yeah, a number of years ago, he said to me, "You know, if I if I can see and hear my our Junui bin, our children speaking my lingo again, I'll be happy." And so I know that that's a uh, drives a lot of what we drives our work, knowing knowing that he said that. So in in getting our school going, we really started. So we started teaching at Kulai preschool in, in 2015. We'd had five or six years of running our after-school learning centres and, and teaching language in a number of schools. And then we quickly realised that one hour a week or a couple of hours a week really isn't enough to bring our language back and to produce proficient and highly proficient speakers. So we, need, we knew that something else was needed. So in 2016, we really started to talk about let's let's get our own school going it's really important um, for two main reasons one key strategy in the revitalization of our language and culture um, so language and culture every day and two very bluntly mainstream schools just are not educating our children and our children are not getting the education they need from mainstream schooling and I think, you know, when we talk about when Europeans first arrived here and the lands were perfect and yet they still needed to be improved, it shows an inability to be happy. And that inability to be happy continues today. And that's what we see in mainstream schools. So we wanted to provide this place that makes our children happy and that our children want to be at. And it's about placing and importance on happiness as well. So these are the reasons we really started to think about and started to plan getting our school happening. Um, in 2020, we, uh, maybe I shouldn't say it publicly, but we bent the rules a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so when COVID hit and kids couldn't go to school, we started our own school <laughs> uh, for seven weeks, three days a week. Um, uh, 13 children, completely on country. We had we had no premises, so it was a on country school, uh, and basically that gave us a lot of insight into what needed to be done, and gave us also a lot of confidence that we could, uh, in fact, run a school. So that then happened in 2020. Uh, at Bemanac, we're really blessed with a lot of um, 
skill, skilled workforce and a really highly skilled board. So across the whole continent, there's less than 100... Well, so, for example, there's less than 100 qualified Aboriginal accountants. We happen to have three of those accountants in Coffs Harbour. Uh, one of those accountants is on our board and one is our Chief Financial Officer. So, and then we also have um, unbelievably skilled and dedicated staff. So driving the school has been a really, a, a truly ground up grassroots initiative. And it hasn't been easy. Uh, there's no step-by-step go -step guide on what you need to do to open a school. So we're now a um, registered independent school with the New South Wales Department of Education. We have to get our registration through the New South Wales Education Standards Authority. But there's no step-by-step -step guide on what you have to do. It's a, it's a real journey of self-discovery. And uh, sometimes I was like, just tell us what we have to do and we'll do it, you know? But the, getting that wasn't so easy. And so to get our school up and running, it was uh, more than 13 policies, the writing of a full curriculum and a financial feasibility model. So it's, it's a business case, basically, which we had to submit and, and get across the line. So there's been other challenges as well, which I'm going to get into, because um, then there's also requirements for premises. So to run the school, we couldn't just do an on-country school. We couldn't just do a mobile school. We have, we have to have the premises. And that was our probably our most difficult stumbling block. But we overcame it. <coughs> Part of uh, getting our school up and running, we always wanted, wanted to be a language school. And so to do that, we knew we had to improve our language. Uh, so for me, I'm well and truly, a, my first language is well and truly English. Uh, Goombenga is my second language. I've been learning now for 15 years. I started learning at the age of 22. Um, and there's 20, 20 highly proficient and proficient speakers of our language today, so very few. And of those 20, there's only two fully qualified teachers, so it poses another challenge for us. So we knew that we had to improve our language. So language classes in 2014. In 2015, we had a visit from a man by the name of Dr. Nahak at Grey Morning, who's a Native American man who's seen a uh, decline of his language, Arapaho, from about 2,000 people, first speak uh, speakers of his language, when he was young to less than 50 today. So he developed this method of teaching language um, that really accelerates learning of people who have had no exposure to the language previously. So for us, so it's a 20, 20, uh, 20, skill sets to create a fully fluent speaker. Um, and you can, you'll see in a minute how quickly people can move. So for us from skill sets one to six, we have approximately 250 images and we're continually challenging ourselves um, to be better. And now that the school's open, we're being forced to improve our language again because we have to keep up with the kids because they move quick. Um, and so, when I first started learning Goombangar back in 2007, uh, I made the decision then that my goal was to speak Goombangar as good as, as I do English. Um, I'm not there yet, but I will get there one day. Um, part of the reason I'm not there yet is because Goombangar has actually improved my English as well. <laughs> um, so, but I will, I will catch up to English at some point. That's, that's my goal and it's important that we keep that. So um, this little video here, this is Nathan. Um, so this is from 2018. At this stage, Nathan had been learning Goombanga for approximately three months, um, no prior exposure, and doing approximately, or less than three hours a week. Um, and so you'll see that he's going to speak to some images, and then I'm going to uh, ask him questions in Goombanga. I'm going to interrogate him in Goombanger, but we don't break into English.
So you can see that I've just done that little bit of questioning, interrogation of, so I said that, do I got a boon mill? So where's that man falling to? And he says, Nalunga, water in. And then he changes it to Nalungu, water to. Okay, so to the water. And so it's important, we, we really challenge ourselves to immerse in language. Um, Nathan is now a highly proficient speaker of Gumbenga, so we can conduct fully immersive conversations. He can tell a number of very long Gumbenga stories, um, up to 15 minutes completely in, in Gumbenga as well. So, um, and that's after approximately four years of, of learning. So he's doing pretty well. So the journey to get here has not, uh, that ocean is rough <laughs> that we have to navigate. And, uh, and I mentioned before about the local mob here who really stand up in the face of colonialism and um, and and challenge challenge colonialism and and have always said that sovereignty never ceded, which is very a true statement. And it's important that we keep challenging that because the lack of of recognised sovereignty for our mobs, the fact that we don't have a treaty has been a main challenge for us. So no treaty, no recognised sovereignty, and so no recognised educational sovereignty. So we couldn't just build a school and make it happen and do it the way we wanted to. Uh, we wanted to originally call our school an immersion school. And once we started the process of registering, we found out that a, an immersion school is actually illegal and it has to be watered down to bilingual, which was um, disappointing for us. Um, and it was something that we were going to challenge. And we nearly said, let's just open our school anyway because no one has um, jurisdiction over us. But then we made the compromise because we couldn't risk if Guri children are going to a school that's not registered that puts them at risk of being taken again. And so that was something that we didn't want to risk. And we needed, we knew we needed to get the, the trust of parents as well to get the enrolments. So that was a compromise that we made. Um, and then Nahak at Grey Morning said to me, well, why would you bother going against it? Just tell them it's a bilingual school. But just know that it's an immersion school, do everything in Gulmengar. The kids speak English anyway because they've got TV and radio, just open the school. Like, don't waste time. So that's what we did. We got it going. I mentioned before that there's approximately 20 highly proficient and proficient speakers of our language and that only two are fully qualified teachers. So our staffing structure is a, a, a challenge for us. So we've created a staffing structure that includes a, a principal who's a non-speaking principal of our school, a non-Gumbenga -speak, non speaking principal, but is learning. A classroom teacher who is also a new learner of Gumbenga as of this year, and two language teachers to also be at the school. Um, so this is really important uh, because the, the funding that government provides for independent schools does not cover that staffing structure. So we've been really lucky to have um, the Paul Ramsey Foundation come on board to support that staffing structure as well. So that's one of the challenges we've had to face. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. 
Um, to premises. So in July last year, we still didn't have a premises. And literally in early August, so literally 12 months ago, TAFE came on board and said, oh, we've got an old bricklaying facility um, that we're no longer using. Do you want it? And I said, yep, we want it. And they said, do you want to look at it? I said, no, we don't have time. <laughs> we just get, it, get in, get the bricks out, and we'll build it. So um, that's our current um, premises, and keep, we'll keep um, in there for a little bit of a time. So, and one of the things that has been a real challenge is this collusion to the ideas that we're less. So Dr Chris Sarr often talks about, you know, the Australian public, and unfortunately, sometimes as, as Aboriginal people, ourselves, Guri people, we've been conned into this idea that we are less and that our culture is less and that if we're teaching our culture, we're going to hold our kids back and all that type of thing. And unfortunately, that's been our experience as well, that we've had to overcome the idea that we are less. And so we, some of the feedback from our own mob was that we're going to hold our kids back and we really wanted to try and... Um, get through that. So I'm just going to fast forward a little bit because I'm running out of time. But just with that in mind, so we can create immersion spaces for our kids and our kids will be fine. They will learn. They will not be left behind in literacy or numeracy. So I'm going to show, I'm just going to fast forward. That's our board, amazing board. So I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just going to fast forward to, so this is Eli, he's a kindergarten student. So there's some stuff going on there. <laughs> so in the old days, our old people were only counting the six. So Garlogan, Bulladi, Bulladi Garlogan, two plus one. Bulladi Bulladi, two plus two. Bulladi Bulladi Garlogan, two plus two plus one. Bulladi Bulladi Bulladi, two plus two plus six. Ah, sorry, two plus two plus two is six. Or Juggle, which is approximately six. So I could say oh, I see approximately six birds flying. So what he's doing there, so, our, so Murubai Language Centre created a new system of numbers in order to be able to, for, to immerse children in maths. So what he's doing there, so that we created the word Guga. So our word for emu was Gugamgan, and it has three toes. So Guga is three. Nao Nao means to be going up, down, or across. All right? So in Roman numerals, that cross is ten. Yeah? So we've shortened it down to Nao. So what Eli is doing here is doing three times ten plus five or whatever. So he's going Guga Nal Mara thirty-five. So these are the. This is where I'm, you know. So the thinking that our culture holds our kids back, we can really, really and truly do away with that now. Yeah. So that's that one. Um, and so Tani, who's the she, so Tani is our classroom teacher. She's a new learner of Gumbengar, but you can see that she's actively using language as well after only six months of, of um, being immersed in the language. So um, I'm going to keep fast forward again to one more. Um, so this video here I quite enjoy. So this is a story I'm telling about uh, telling a man not to drink the water from the river because uphill there were some cows who did their business when they were crossing the river. Yeah? So they did a poo in the water, so that water is no good, Bulgar. So you see, as I'm telling this story, one of our students uh, will get up and interrupt me and kind of tell the story, but that's okay because it tells me that he knows the story, right? And he knows it all in language because it's never been translated to him in English before. So he knows the story. Hey. 
So he gets up. And so I said to that man, don't drink that water. But that man turned around to me and said, don't speak Goombanger because it was no good. I'm a white man, speak to me in English. Right? So the little cow got up and uh, finished that sentence for me. So um, am I out of time? Yep. Oh, sorry. So I'm going over time, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, but thank you all for, uh, for listening in. Um, we're very proud of our school and... Um, I'm very, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Yamna Wigan Jungalay, the Gunjangagayi La Gili. Thank you all, and um, yeah, Yari Rang. Yeah. That was uh, inspirational. That's, um, that's the way forward, education, and uh, I've got a few thoughts. But has anyone got any? Uh, well, obviously, thank Clark for sharing his story. I think it's, it's truly amazing. Has anyone got any questions they'd like to ask of? Clark, about the journey, the practicality, anything, I guess. You're willing to... Yeah, yep, we are. So we're, we're still teaching at, yeah, more than 20 mainstream schools as well. Um, and it, sometimes there's a bit of pressure on us due to not having many um, speakers of our language. However, it's also a good opportunity to train more teachers um, to come up. So, um, yeah, it's important that we do that as well. Yeah. Rachel? Hang on a sec, Rachel, we'll get a mic to you just so everyone can, uh, online mainly. <clears throat> thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Um, thank you. I was just saying it's so impressive what you've all done up there. I'm, I'm just blown away with the effort and what you've achieved. So um, thank you for sharing it with us. Um, I was just interested to know, so is, is the, the idea by, you were saying it's essentially immersion school. So the idea is you, you're planning to teach across the whole curriculum in Gumbangira then, and so there must be a lot of work going on for you all in, in terms of developing that curriculum in science and all sorts of other areas. I'm just wondering how, um, how you're finding that, how, you, how you're approaching that aspect of it. Yeah, um, thank you. Yes, so we're definitely aspiring to be a complete immersion school. Um, and a lot, of it's, uh, a lot of the subject area is really quite easy, if I'm honest. So my understanding of, of science, for example, before this journey was Bunsen burners. Um, and I've come to understand that it's actually just country, right? understanding country. So getting our kids on country <laughs> they go, um, uh, is really important. We, at the moment, we estimate that we're at about 60% of our day in Goombanger, 40% English. So our goal is to improve that to 80% Goombanger by the end of the year. And next year, about in 12 months' time, get up to 90% in Goombanger language. So um, we, we, we see that a lot of, especially in the current cohort, K-2, stage one, um, a lot of, it's really, I just sit on the classes and go, this is really easy for us to translate. Um, so this, this summer, we'll have time to actually really plan for that and... Um, and, and start to really focus on immersion settings. Yeah, thank you. What an amazing, is this on? Yeah, what an amazing journey and so much adversity you've overcome. What's one thing that you wish you'd known at the start or one thing that would have really helped you over the last 10 years to, to get to where you are today that would have made a big difference? Land. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, land. Having having a having the premises for us, um, even a step by step guide. So, part of the the really huge difficulty we had to secure a premises is that you have got to get it approved by the rural fire service. Then it's got to be approved by the council as a fit for a like a zoned appropriately for a school, um, and then the premises has to be ticked off by the Department of Education to meet all the standards. So. If we had more land back and we and we could um, 
build our school in a culturally appropriate way, that, that, would, be a, that would be huge. I've got a quick follow-on from that. I was, I was talking about something on the weekend, and I, I was talking about school. And it dawned on me that the majority of school, my kids in school, we, we take them, put them in a room with four walls, yeah. and then start teaching them about outside, you know? And we never take them out on country. So yeah. you mentioned you kind of rebelled, and we won't say that you taught in COVID, <laughs> yeah. uh, and taught on country. How much now of the, of the classes operates in and outside of those four walls? Yeah, so we, we do at least one day per week where the kids actually leave the school and go to important sites or um, just go fishing on country. Um, we even try to increase that to two days a week. And in fact, when we first opened the school, um, COVID hit as well as floods um, as our school was being built. So there was trades people who couldn't um, complete the job in time. So the first... We couldn't officially open the school for the first three weeks of school term because the premises wasn't ready. So we just said, okay, we'll run a, a cultural program. And so it was a cultural program by Bemanac and we got the kids that way. So the first three weeks were completely on country with our, with our kids. So um, it kind of was a blessing in disguise because that's what we really wanted to do anyway. Mm. Um, and now we, yeah, just continue continue at least, at least weekly. Um, as the school grows, um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for us to maintain that, but um, we're definitely committed to it. The, the location of our school at the moment is just down the road from the Botanical Gardens. So, you know, uh, plant identification and stories of plant, all that type of thing, um, we can do quite easily. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yep, we've still got couple of minutes. Um, sorry. I just, um, I read an article the other day and it was talking about how when first contact happened, um, the punishment for practising language and caring for country, that's still seen today in modern times. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, what is the biggest challenge you faced, you know, trying to teach kids who are existing in, within two sovereignties? Yeah. Yeah. Um um, yeah, good question. Um, so obviously navigating the colonial system is, is a big challenge. But then also, as I mentioned, um, overcoming the collusion to the idea that our culture is, leaves our kids at a deficit. That was, um, that's something that I think is really important. Um, Hopefully, I think we are now starting to see our community understand that kids in their culture is a really good thing. And, um, but I think that's been a, probably a main challenge um, to get uh, all, all parents on board, basically. Um, and like in, in, you know, some of it I don't uh, I understand as well, because I do understand because you know, a new school, never been, never been done before. So I think people um, have a right to, to walk and kind of go, oh, is this the right thing for my child? Um, but hopefully we're, you know, from that end. However, there's some thoughts around deficit, that culture creates a deficit that we really need to still overcome in our community. And, that's, and I think that work is ongoing and continuing at the moment. Yeah. I have a, I'll, yeah, we've got still got time, but I'll run with one online while you're getting the mic. So someone's asked, I'm not sure if they're talking about uh, other, other mob from different country or, or also non-Aboriginal people, but would kids who are not from country be able to attend and learn language or is it just for local Gumbanya? Uh, no, so we our, so our school is 100% Aboriginal school, so 100% Aboriginal staff. 100% Aboriginal student enrolment. Not all of our kids are Agumbenger by descent or heritage. However, they all live on Gumbenger country. So um, I mentioned before that language belongs in country. So by learning the language of that country, um, that's most culturally appropriate to where they're living. Um, so we're, that's, how we, that's how we do the enrolments. Yeah, cool. 
Got a question here? Hi. Um, my question sort of related to the one, not the last one, but the one before. Yeah. Um, have there been any pushbacks or hoops from the department, you know, in terms of, um, like, the community's agenda, the language revitalisation agenda versus the NAPLAN sort of ticking the boxes and the sort of cookie-cutter approach? Um, yep. Have there been any challenges there? Uh, I, have to, I have to say, although I, you know, I can be critical of the system, uh, the colonial system, since we've s started moving in this way, um, we've had a lot of support from um, different people within the Department of Education, for sure. And I think people are now starting to see what, what culture does for our children um, and so it's starting to be supported in a big, in a big way. Uh, I think mainstream education has been trying to uh, understand why attendance of our children is low sometimes. And we've created this place where our kids want to be at school. So literally none of our parents have had the issue of getting their kids to school on any day because they're happy. And that's why we, we place a large emphasis on, on happiness of our children. So, yeah, I have to, I have to say we've had mainly support from, from people in the, in the department. Good one. I think we're... Oh, yeah, we've got time for one quick one, yeah. I'm just wondering, um, in play, whether you're noticing that the children are speaking to one another in language? Yeah, good one. Mm. Ah, that's a really good one. So... We, we are now starting to police that more closely as teachers. So we really want them to play in language. Um, that's really important. So, uh, so there's things like when they're playing soccer, for example. So really trying to get them to kick the ball to me and I'll kick the ball to you. So we're really trying to get them to use that play language. Some of it we've had to um, create create words. Um, so for example, basketball, when they so so garaji is to jump, right? And if I say garaji gura, that makes that means make jump. <laughs> so garaji gura nari dumbai, make jump that ball. Yeah. So so things like that. So the, and they are st starting to now speak Gumbangra as they play as well. But we still have work to do. We, this, we still definitely need to improve that and we need to police it more so. So, um, And as teachers, as language teachers, we also need to be setting the example. So Ellie and I, who's language teacher at our school, we don't use language... Ah, oh, sorry, we don't use English. We're just in Goombenga all day when we're at the school because it's about setting the example and that's um, really important to bringing our language back. So we, what, we, what we really want to do is for our kids to then speak Goombenger by default. Yeah? Does that make sense? So they default into Goombenger. That's our, that's our big goal. Great. Well, it's a, a wrap. So, first of all, I want to thank you not only for coming and talking, mate, but for, for being in one of the vanguard of such an important movement. You know, like you've proved that it's possible, you know, and I think you're hopefully, in my mind's eye, I see a time where all schools in this country are speaking language from country. So you guys are, are completely very inspirational and, and thanks a lot. So everyone thank me for Clark. <laughs> thanks, mate. Oh, thank you. Thank you.